Welcome to Redbeard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and today we are talking about something that every one of us has to do, and all of us can get better at. We're talking about that call that happens between when someone first hears about you and when they sign a big contract with you. That's the discovery call. And we have Christina Ruling here from Keep to go and talk to us about some things we can be doing to get better at selling on that discovery call. Christina, welcome to Redbeard Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. I I'm very passionate about doing discovery calls because they will make or break a sale. You know, you've always heard the always be closing ABC. Mm -hmm. And that really, I think, comes from you have to be closing from the very first conversation, the very sentence that you have. You have to start with the end in mind. And it really boils down to having a good discovery call. If you have a good discovery call, you can either determine that the prospect's not a good fit and move on. Or you can determine that the prospect's a good fit and you had a great call and they trust you and they want to move forward in the process. Love it. So let's start with what makes a discovery call bad. What are the danger signs that we're about to screw up this call with a prospect? Yes, definitely. So two common mistakes I think that salespeople make that kill a sale is first, they just start feature dumping right off the bat. Mm. And prospects actually expect this. They expect you to just come in in the first call and just tell them everything you've got. Give them your spiel or give them your demo. And you should never, never, never schedule a demo on your first call interaction with a prospect. I think the second biggest mistake that salespeople make on a discovery call is not asking enough questions and not being genuinely curious. I mean, there's a few reasons why that's so important. It's to qualify, of course, to find out if there is a need and if there is a fit, because you don't want to waste your time, you know, demoing somebody that there's no need, but then to find out their pain points and their hot buttons. And doing this really also is what builds the trust and the rapport. When you're genuinely curious about their business and you ask those questions, That's really what builds trust and rapport because it makes the prospect feel like you care about them and their business and their needs. You don't need to build rapport at the beginning of the call by talking about the weather and all that small chit chat. That is not rapport. Tell me about how I can assess if the questions I'm asking are the right questions in my discovery call. Yes. Good question. So If you want to control what happens at the end of a sales call, you need to focus on the beginning, Mm -hmm. right? So a simple tool that any salesperson can use to gain control of a sales call is by doing what's called an upfront contract. It's something that I learned in Sandler training. And until I learned to master this, I would get so many prospects telling me, hey, I don't want to answer all of your questions about my business. I just want to learn about your product. And that completely created friction and the deal would just die from that point. Yeah. So a salesperson must have control of the call at all times, but the best salespeople can spin it so that their prospect feels like they're the ones controlling the call, which really lets their defensive guard down. You know, as buyers, we immediately have our defenses up. For example, we'll walk into a car dealership with our armor on, determined not to get sold by the car salesman and pressured. And our defenses are up. And so it's natural to want to keep your cards close to your chest and not divulge too much information to the salesperson, you know, out of fear that they're going to try to use it against you to pressure sell you, especially when you're asking them pain points. So... Before I talk about like the good questions to ask, I want to talk about how you get permission to ask those questions so the prospect is comfortable answering them. So, you know, how do we set the prospect at ease from the beginning while making them feel in control and be open to answering the questions without the pushback? So that really starts with the upfront contract. So an upfront contract It really changed my life in Sandler training. It gives you the control. It makes the prospect feel like they're in control. It gives you permission to ask the questions so that they understand the importance of why you're doing that so you can get to know their needs. And then that really shows that you care about them and it builds the rapport and trust that I was talking about. So there's the first few things to remember on an upfront contract and what it does. First, 
it removes confusion by making sure that you and your prospect have the same thing in mind. Mm -hmm. It puts your prospect at ease. You know, people always feel better when they know what lies ahead. Mm -hmm. People love to buy, but they hate to be sold. Yeah. Get your prospect to see you as an equal partner in the process. You're there to diagnose and solve the problems. And you can't do that if the prospect views you as a nuisance or somebody that they can just boss around. The upfront contract is a couple of things. First, you want to set a time agreement. So always confirm, you know, hey, John, I have an hour down for a call today. Does that still work for you? Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're respectful of their time. The second is your prospect's agenda. So, you know, you might say something like, you'll have a lot of questions for me about our product and service. And beyond that, what are you hoping to accomplish in our time together? So it allows them to immediately tell you what they're hoping to get out of this call. What kind of answers do you often hear back when you ask that question? That's a great question. So that's going to be like, oh, well, I just wanted to know about the different products that you have or the different services that you have and if they would be a good fit for me. Great. Awesome. You already knew that to begin with, but you're allowing them to say it and you're telling them that you care about answering their questions, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's not just all about you. So then the third thing to talk about is your agenda. You say, you know, I know you're going to have a lot of questions and I'll have questions too, to better understand your needs and your goals and your areas of opportunity to determine if I can help you. And then you ask them for an agreement on that. Does that sound good, John? Great. Okay. And then you want to talk about the outcome at the end. This is super important. You know, you can say something like at the end, you know, after I get to understand your business needs a little bit more, you get your questions asked, then you and I can come to an agreement at the end if this will work and you want to move forward and we'll make a next step in the decision-making process Or if we decide it's not a fit and you might want to go elsewhere, then we can, you know, part ways. So you're limiting the investment of time and energy into the buying decision on both the part of the salesperson and also the prospect. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Love it. It's taking the ease off of them where it's slowly letting their defenses down because you're telling them like, hey, if we find it's not a good fit and it's a no, like it's totally cool, John, you can... You can go your way. I'm not trying to pressure sell you into anything, but I genuinely care about what your needs are so that I can best help you. And then the last thing in an upfront agreement is you always want to remind them that five minutes before your time is up, you want to leave five minutes to set the next steps Mm -hmm. because oftentimes you'll start feature dumping and then your time is up and then the prospect is like okay thanks gotta go talk to you next time and then you're like wait 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 i want to set a call with you for next time and then Mm -hmm. you just don't get it and then you're just going to hope and pray that they call you and they're just going to get on the be back bus which is you know hey i'll be back when i'm ready Mm -hmm. you never want to do that you always want to set your next step now comes with the questioning, right? Uh-huh. Like you asked me, what kinds of questions should you ask? One of the best things I learned in my first professional sales job almost 20 years ago, I'm aging myself here, was that features tell, benefits sell. That's always stuck with me. And I see so many people, especially like in Keep, where you know, you're doing software demos, you wanna show them all these cool features but that's not selling. You you have to sell on the benefits. Questions lead to confessions and telling isn't selling. I want to hold on to that word confessions right there because that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. You talk about demoing Keep and I've been a Keep certified partner since 2013, a Keep user since 2012. And I don't know all the functionality of the software and I'm one of the world experts. (laughs) It turns out that there's stuff I don't know, both because it's bigger than I could ever fully know, but also it's always changing. Yeah. So the idea that I'll just show you a hundred things mm-hmm. is so much worse than, okay, of the hundred things Keep can do for you, these three are the highest area of opportunity. Yeah. And that's part of what I did in my book, 20 Easy Ways to Make Money with Plus This, is I said, okay, Plus This, which plays well with Keep, Plus This has over 50 different functionalities. And I say, okay, I'm going to cover only 20 of them. And of those 20, look at these three first. Yeah. And so I'm focusing you. If you read my book, and it's at redbirduniversity.com slash book is the free download. If you read my book, then this right here, 
start with these three. So I love that. And I love what you said about confessions, because what that gets to is that we often don't want to show how we're vulnerable. We don't want to show how we have failed. Yeah. And often if you have a problem, if your desk is messy, if you didn't get up on time, if your workout schedule is screwed up, if you worked too late last night, you don't want to confess it because it looks like it's bad on you. Mm-hmm. A salesperson is the last person you want to talk about because then you know they're going to use that to go sell to you. Yeah. I just, that word, yeah. I love it, Christina, the word confession. So we get confessions by asking good questions. Mm-hmm. How are we going to do that in a respectful way that doesn't elicit that response of, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to show you my soft underbelly. Yeah. I think that comes back to the upfront contract where you're letting them know that, hey, we're partners in this conversation together. We're equal partners. I'm here to answer your questions Mm -hmm. and you are going to answer my questions so that I can better understand your needs and goals. Because I can sit here and do like a dog and pony show for an hour for you and tell you all the things that you know, keep does, for example, but that's not going to help you because I don't know what's relevant to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you can talk about all the things that plus this does forever. And I always use the example sometimes in prospect calls is, did you know that Microsoft Excel, you can write code in it? Well, if I was demoing Microsoft Excel to you and you don't have a need to write code, why would I show you that? Why would I talk about that? That's just going to confuse you. And then you're going to think, oh, Well, just it does too much. I don't need it. But in reality, we all need Excel in our lives. And it doesn't treat a person as an individual, which if you're selling something like Keep, which is all about automated individualized follow up, but then you're treating the prospect like I'm going to give you the same talk I gave the last hundred people Mm -hmm. and ignore the fact that you have your own problems and your own ambitions. Mm -hmm. It's that really I'm talking to you, Christina, as a human. I'm not talking to you as one of the hundred guests on our beard radio. We're having a conversation about us. This is not a templatized conversation. It's a me talking with you about your field of expertise to go deliver that to all the listeners. Mm-hmm. And you got to feel that if it feels completely templatized, like there's no heart in the conversation, people are going to notice that our BS detectors are better than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. A lot of people can do their own research online for days. Right. No legit business owner is going to take an hour out of their day to schedule a call on your calendar just out of sheer curiosity if they don't have a real need and real pain. Well, it's not good either for you because if you're saying my time is worth so little, just go ahead and book a time with me if you're casual. That's no good. Yeah. That when I'm talking to people about hiring me as a fractional COO, the answer is great. Maybe do a bit of pre-qualification through text message or Twitter or whatever. And then it's great. Bookredbeard.com, go grab a 20-minute spot, and we'll have a quick chat. And then either it's a yes or a no. Yeah. Because I don't have time. I'm not going to spend an hour on the phone with somebody who's not well qualified unless we're about to get to a yes or a no. Totally. Either way, it's fine. I always operate by if there is no pain, there is no sale. Mm. And if I cannot find pain from you, then I'm not going to waste my time on it. Mm -hmm. And also people are very reluctant to tell you their pain. And they don't always know it. Exactly. Sometimes I have calls with people where they don't know that, let's say, a technology can do a certain thing. They go, wait, it can do that or I don't know how to do that right now. And it's actually, they are hurting, but they don't know it. And so you have to have your questions ready and individualized sufficient for that person because you've done your research on them. For example, with my fractional COO part of my business, a very common question I ask is, so in your meetings, and I'm talking to the founder, right? In your meetings, is it you asking people how they're doing or is it someone else running the meeting following a set agenda? Yeah. And of course, the answer is always, uh, it's, it's pretty much me asking people. And I say, okay, well, what would it feel like if each week you attended your team meeting that someone else ran following a set agenda and everyone gave their two or three metrics then, and then you just got to attend the meeting? How would that feel? And people go, oh, Because they didn't really think about the fact that how they're running the team meeting is actually sabotaging their profits. But as soon as they hear that, they go, oh, so you've elicited this need that maybe they didn't know that you brought it to the surface through asking a good question. And then you can dive into, well, what would that look like in detail? Let's talk about 
how we would get there. Yes. Completely individualized for that one entrepreneur. That's so important. You know, the saying of people, you don't know what you don't know it is mm. truly powerful. And a lot of people will get in these things and they may not have pain, but it's because they may not know the pain. And so you have to ask the right questions to get them to come to the realization of the pain that they do have. Mm -hmm. And what's really important is when you dig into the pain, you have to get them to convince themselves that they have this pain and they need this product or service mm. because people don't argue with their own opinions. Uh huh. You can't tell them that they have the pain. You have to ask the right questions for them to say, yes, I see that now. Now I understand what this is costing me by not having this, uh -huh. things like that. And I think that asking those leading questions. So, you know, it, it could be something like how many more leads or deals would you have if you had something like this in place already? Because they, they don't realize that. They think that I'm using Keep as an example. You know, they think that maybe just blasting newsletters out to their people once a month is following up and it's automation and it's not. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that there is, you know, automation that you could send out that puts people in certain buckets of where they're at in the pipeline and send the right message at the right time according to what they're interested in. And that will help you increase your sales conversion. Like Macy's is horrible for it. I always use a Macy's example. Every day I get a freaking Macy's sale in my inbox <laughs> that says Macy's one day sale, you know, and I might get Macy's one day sale on men's underwear. I don't need men's underwear. <laughs> you know, they're not tracking my behaviors and what's important to me. And people don't understand, like, if you have those things in place, you probably get a lot more sales and you're leaving money on the table. So asking them those right questions to get them to realize, oh, yeah, yeah. And convince themselves is the right way to do it. And also, one more important thing is don't be afraid to ask if they're looking at other solutions. Mm. Yeah. So many salespeople are hesitant or afraid to ask if they're looking at a competitors. And you don't know what you're up against if you don't know what they're looking at. You know, you have to understand their buying process and understanding what competitors they're looking at will also help you leverage, you know, how you can pitch your product against that. I think that's so important. I was in a sales call where the prospect asked me about what would it be like to go with an agency instead of going with me to do COO kind of work. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I said, well, here's the plus sides and here's the downsides of that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Here's what your budget's going to look like on and on. Mm -hmm. And that gave him the information because I was, you know, shooting straight about there's some good advantages over hiring a team versus working with someone yeah. where there's a person you're working with. Yep. And that was able to go increase the trust as we're talking about what all he really cared about, where he could identify, oh, for what he cares about, he actually wants me to think of his problems as my problems, not an agency that has a, a number of project managers that are supporting according to a templatized process, et cetera. Yep. And that's really good that he brought that up. But what would have happened if he didn't disclose that to you? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't talk as much about, well, there's really two basic different kinds of fractional COOs. There's the People where it's a person you're hiring who is spending some of their attention and then, or there's hiring an agency where they have a templatized process, which has some significant benefits and also has some lack of customization downsides. And you have a lot of junior team members involved, which have their own pluses and minuses. Just a different experience will probably get you a different outcome. Mm -hmm. Yep. I love it. Yep. I want to give one more thing yeah. that I think is so, so important aside from asking for competitors always ask for objections. People are hesitant to give you the objections. So at the end of the call, ask them, is there any reason why this won't work for you? Mm -hmm. Again, questions lead to confessions. And if you just ask that, is there a reason why this won't work for you? They're going to bring out stuff they may not have told you in the first place so that it allows you to prepare to overcome those things. Super important. I love it. Sometimes I ask, what's the worst case? Mm. Yeah. If this doesn't go well, what would that look like? And then let's compare that to your worst case if you don't bring me on. Yeah. And if you continue to have all these problems, you, the prospect, just talked about in depth, if all those things keep on happening for three months, which is our standard initial contract length, mm -hmm. what's that going to feel like if that is your reality for another three months? Let's compare worst case to worst case just to get a sense of what are you risking? Let's bring up to the fore the financial risk, the energy risk, the focus risk. So we can really have a good conversation and so we can wind up with a yes or a no 
by the end of that conversation. Yep, I love it. Well, Christina, you've given us some great tools here. Let's go list them off here. We have the conversation contract. How did you phrase that? Upfront contract. Upfront contract. We have the questions lead to confessions mindset. What else did we talk about here? We talked about how doing all of that will really break down the defenses and the guard for your prospects. Super important so that they stop holding their cards close to their chest and they understand that you're asking those questions because you genuinely care. You inspire me, Christina, to think about if our goal is to sell to an individual, to a specific person, then while we can say we have their best interests at heart, it's also we have the goal of selling to them. If instead our goal is to sell to all the people who we ought to be working with, for whom it is actually an advantageous situation, that feels different. I would actually change that and say yeah. the goal is to help. Yeah. If I'm a direct salesperson, my goal is not to sell on every call. My goal is to help. If I feel like I can help you, I'm going to help you. But if I feel like it's not a good fit because you don't have the right things in place or you don't have the right mindset or you just don't need it because you have other good tools in place, I don't want to sell you. Mm -hmm. My goal is to genuinely help. So keeping that in our hearts as we're working on breaking down the defensiveness of our prospects, that's what makes that a, a noble, ethical, honorable thing is if you keep in your heart that your goal is to help people, which might mean helping them say no to you Mm -hmm. or say yes and keep that in our hearts. Oh, and helping them get out of their own way sometimes. That's critical. Because when you can help somebody, sometimes you have to ask them the right questions to help them get out of their own way. Yeah. Hugely important. Christina, thank you so much for being on the show. Where can people follow you? People can follow me on Facebook, Christina Ruling. That's R-U-E-L-I-N-G, Christina with a K. I'm the only Christina Ruling out there, so you just search for me. (laughs) One and only. (laughs) Yes, you can find me on Insta and LinkedIn. Wonderful. Christina, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was a great talk.